Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 726. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's April 5th, 2022. All right, well, thank you for joining us again as we go through all the news, Anglican and that, around the world. It's a, uh, It's been a fun 726 episodes. I can't believe we've been going that long. Um, you know, the number one question, George, is to, does George own a home yet? And, you know, I, I've been anxious about this for a, about a month now. I know you and Susan kind of been a little bit anxious, but I've been more anxious for you. What's the answer? <laughs> Yes, we went to settlement on Friday, April 1st, and my goodness, I was so excited when I got home and I wanted to go straight to sleep because it, after 90 plus days of fiddling around with the mortgage company and everything, yeah. it was done. But as soon as we got home, Susan started taking me around. I want you to knock down this wall. I want you to get the pressure washer and get this... Uh, a mold off the side of the house and she's mm-hmm. got me with a year's worth of projects and home renovations all lined up and she's going to start making her own curtains all the things that she's oh, wanted yeah. to do but when you live in church housing or rented accommodations you never can do you got yourself a honey-do list not just a house that's great though yeah i i remember going through what we went through and uh getting a mortgage if you're not going to pay cash is just it's a root canal times 10 and uh, mm-hmm. just so happy for you and susan uh, jill and i want to take you out to dinner as a little celebration sometime this week so uh that'll that'll be fun uh here what what's yeah. what's what's crazy is that uh, the housing prices in florida are starting to shoot up mm-hmm. faster and faster we 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 negotiated a price in december and we went to settle on april 1st the uh, Zillow value of our house, with nothing done whatsoever, has gone up 20% uh, since uh, the end of the year. Yeah. It's crazy. No, absolutely. You know, th- this this uh, hyperinflation that we're going through, especially in, in real estate and even in the RV market, you know, this thing I bought uh, six months ago, this, this RV is worth almost twice as what it was before. And that's just, that's insane, George. Now, and some people are tempted to sell, but the problem is then you have to buy. And where can you, and rents are going through the roof uh, around here in Florida. The Tampa has one of the highest rental increases year to year in the country. Um, And so people are fleeing the north. And so people who've lived here for 20 or 30 years, just renting an apartment, all of a sudden the landlord says, Oh, it's not th- it's not 2400 it's 3200 starting in June and uh, you have to sign a lease for that much and they can't afford it because their salary didn't go up and they have to find elsewhere to go well you can't go to New York City you can't go to, well you probably go to Chicago I don't think Chicago has increased at all or anywhere in Illinois but there's no place to go and there's no jobs where you have to go to resettle well, it's a combination of demand. People moving to Florida all the time. It's one of the. It and Texas have done very, very well uh, in terms of population growth, mm-hmm. and also inflation. Money doesn't pay by what it once does. When I don't know how much the government has inflated the supply of money in circulation, but it's starting to hit home, in big things like houses and in little things like the grocery store. Mm-hmm. It's- it's a crazy time, so, and we, we do pray for our nation as it, it goes through this time uh, of trouble, but uh, it's consistent because we've always been in a time of trouble. George, lots of news to talk about, some fun stories, some strange stories, and our, our first story is going to be a Archbishop, former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams. He uh, gave his opinion uh, about uh, who you can pray for and who you can't pray for, uh, something that's been discussed in uh, uh, Britain now for uh, eons and has been going back and forth of whether or not they're going to pass a bill, whether or not it's going to be a legal bill uh, in, in parlance. And uh, Rowan says, oh, by the way, you not just can you not pray for gay, you cannot pray for transgendered. And I thought, oh, no. Oh, There's no. a... Yeah, there's a letter that came out on Monday addressed to the Prime Minister, an open letter, and Ron Williams' name is 
right at the top of the list at the bottom. Mm -hmm. A little bit of background. Britain has been experimenting with the criminalization of conversion therapy mm -hmm. on the grounds that it is mean and cruel and oppressive. Now, in the United States, various localities, municipalities have tried to do this, and they've been swatted down by the federal courts on free speech rights and free association rights. It's one thing to, to grab somebody off the street, lock them up, and then try to brainwash them. That's illegal. It always has been. Always has but been. It, but that was done a little while in the 80s. They had these conversion camps out mm -hmm. in Colorado, and this is where the bad reputation came from. But if you have a desire uh, that if you feel troubled in your heart, if you does, if, if you need help with these urges or instincts, mm -hmm. you should be able to, by your own choice, go and see a psychologist or a counselor or a therapist. So Canada has already swallowed the Kool-Aid, and I'm pretty sure Canada has uh, forbidden conversion therapy, mm -hmm. maybe on a provincial level, but I don't want to overstate that. The government of Boris Johnson has promised to do this as well, and it's under lo extreme lobbying pressure from gay activists, including gay church activists. Now, a few weeks ago, a letter signed by several thousand clergy said, look, if you criminalize our praying for people who want help with their sexual orientation, we will gladly go to jail. And the Church of England as an institution in the hierarchy didn't do anything other than to say, well, we don't think conversion therapy is a good thing, even though they don't define what it is. It, it, it's just political nonsense. Well, the government has done, at this stage, a double, perhaps a triple U-turn. It keeps announcing it's going to ban conversion therapy, then it's not going to ban it. So now it's going to take a legislative approach. It's going to have a partial ban. And on Monday, Oasis, which is a gay lobbying church group, put out a letter to Boris Johnson with uh, Rowan Williams as the top signatory, urging the government to include transgender people in the ban on conversion therapy, prayers and activities. And I'll read to you the throwaway line. To be trans is to enter a sacred journey of becoming whole, precious, honored and loved by yourself, by others and by God. Rowan Williams signed a letter with that statement in it. I don't know if it's an age thing, but when we're talking transgendered people, we're talking people who have a psychological condition called gender dysphoria, a body image condition where in this day and age, uh, they find that they do not like their body and they are convinced changing the, the sexual gender of their body will make them feel better. Nowhere in the history of mankind has therapy been more called for and prayer been more called for than helping people with their body image. And it, it, it is not the gospel about this. You know, George, how did Rowan go so bad on this? I don't understand. Well, I think his liberal political instincts overcame his intellectual uh, instincts. Gender dysphoria is a kid. My daughter uh, was hospitalized for uh, anorexia and bulimia. She had a body image problem. She thought she was too fat, and nothing could convince her in terms of logical discussion. Reason she or was logic? She would not listen to reason or logic, right? Well, she and it's it's been now five, six years since she was hospitalized, mm -hmm. and she is you're never cured but she knows how to live with it and in fact after this occurred she changed her nursing specialty so now she's a nurse a psychiatric nurse um, because she feels called to work and minister with people and she sees nursing as a vocation akin to the priesthood mm -hmm. to suffer from these uh, manias or fixations now part of the problem is that in this country, we don't require the crazy homeless guy to be treated. He's given the right to be crazy and to be living an awful life. But here's the thing, in conversion therapy is people who want it, who want to be able to get out of the cycle of anorexia, who want to get out of the cycle of thinking that they're trapped in the wrong body. Because 
you know, one of the literatures that's now coming out is that so many people who have been sucked into transgenderism find that this was, if you will, a phase of mental aberration like my daughter's anorexia. One of the, the but largest... Then one of the largest trends of YouTube videos right now, and if you want to go to YouTube and type, I regret my transition, um, you will find thousands and thousands of kids who completely uh, macerated their bodies uh, be on counsel of teachers and doctors who regret it now, who said, you know, I was just going through adolescence. I was mm -hmm. just, you know, getting used to these hormones in my body, and I was convinced to cut off my genitals. And here in Florida, we have uh, a local flap of the Walt Disney Corporation. Some of its woke employees have demanded that the government uh, undo a law which uh, says teachers may not discuss sexuality and sexual practices for children below the third grade, which I think is nine, eight or nine. Yeah, five, six, seven or nine. Seven, eight. Yeah. And here's the thing. What adult, and you first off, some gay actress said, oh, this is terrible, I'm a kindergarten teacher, and now I can't share my sexuality with my children. Friends, what adult in their right minds wants to share their sexuality, any sort of sexuality, with a five-year-old who's not their child? Mm -hmm. That person, I think, is a pervert who wants to do that. And, and the opponents of the law say, oh, it's don't say gay. Well, it has, has nothing to do with that. It's... It, it, it's basically clever marketing on the gay lobbyist side. Well, here's the point. Uh, a gay employee of Walt Disney, who was a gay activist, po published a letter in the Orlando Sun Sentinel's op-ed page saying, I am offended by these gay activists who are forcing sexuality. When I was a little child and I wanted to try a dress on, uh, 40 years ago, I would if I were a child today, they'd immediately put me into sexual uh, change therapy. Yeah. When in reality, I'm gay, and I and basically, this transgender movement is trying to destroy homeless gays and is trying to destroy women. It does, it does uh, and this is a gay activist writing. Yeah, I, I remember back in middle school and elementary school, all the tomboys, uh, the girls, and I grew up in farming communities, and the girls were just more uh, tomboyish in the chores they did and what they liked. They didn't like dolls as much, but they, they formed into these beautiful women over time. They weren't always tomboys. And in today's day and age, we take them and we give them uh, hormone denial and then we give them testosterone. testosterone. It's so uh, frustrating. It's, it's ideological madness. And what is so sad is just uh, Rowan Williams saying, to be trans is to enter a sacred journey of becoming whole. That's confusing the illness with wholeness. With holiness. And, with, and it, holiness. It, and righteousness. Where if you are convicted by the, if I were a person who had same sex desire or had desired um, to change my body image from male to female, and I was convicted by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit convinces me that, no, I am as God intended, and I call up the Archbishop of Canterbury and say, uh, Justin Welby, I need you to pray for me because I've been convicted by the Holy Spirit. I no longer want to be same-sex uh, attracted. What should I do? Can you pray for me? And, and, and Justin Welby would have to say, what, George? No. 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 I can't. And I, I must lead you, Kevin. Uh, you don't don't pray for this. You were on the right journey before your confession. It's like George this it, is so screwed up. Well, it's it's a sign that the church is captive to the spirit of the age. Yeah. When we have reasonably intelligent people, we may disagree with Rowan Williams on many political issues, but nobody would say that the man doesn't think. Except when I read this this and i'm thinking how does he respond to somebody who wants help he tells them no you're wrong your journey to mutilate yourself is really a journey to wholeness when i see a man in a dress i see somebody crying for help because they have this this horrible uh, affliction where they have the the social anxiety 
where they can't go out in public as themselves and have to put on a dress and have to put on a wig and take up on makeup to go out and be flamboyant as somebody else to get that attention that they so desire. They can't get the attention they want as themselves. That is a treatable psychological condition through therapy and prayer. Oh, for crying out loud, Rowan. I, I, th- th- Kevin, what really gets you going? Well, what really gets me going are the topics of this and climate change. So, crazy. All right, there's more news to talk about, and that would be the primates. The primates got together and had a primates meeting in London. It wasn't a gathering. It wasn't Lambeth. But it was their kind of first get-together in a long time, especially post-COVID. And it's interesting because CNN wasn't there. The BBC wasn't there. Anglican TV wasn't there, so it was it was a nothing. And they said it was going to be a nothing. We're going to get together and we're going to have tea. We're going to meet each other and have fellowship and gather. And I thought that's cool because they knew to. This is their first meeting since COVID. And most of these people haven't really met in person before. So you and I decided hey, we're going to step back and see what happens. And we got a communique that said nothing really happened, George. That's correct. There was a 22-point communique which matched the pre-meeting statements. Now, what did they do? We've been in touch with uh, GAFCON's leadership and other people, and we think we have a good idea of what took place. And it was introduce yourself. Where are you in your walk in your life personally? Where is your church today? What issues are of importance to you? And this allowed Uh, primates to speak of local issues of significant concern and that's important allowing people to speak those issues but it has no real church-wide effect Mm -hmm. for instance Pakistan the Prime Minister has dissolved the National Assembly and there's a fear that the Islamists will take power that's a major concern for the Christian minority in Pakistan and rightly so for the Archbishop Is it an issue of salvation or faith or church order and discipline for the archbishops of anybody else? No, it's not. So what happened was we had statements like this, war in Ukraine and things of all that nature, which are not to be dismissed as unimportant, but it's the reason why the press wasn't there, because the Church of England's views on uh, the Uh, reunification of North and South Korea are of no consequence. But what did take place that was, I think, important took place after the meeting at the press conference. Justin Welby did it again. He hijacked the meeting and spun it for his own... He hijacked the press conference. He hijacked the press conference and spun the meeting to his own end. Mm -hmm. And so Justin Welby had a statement saying that we really want to avoid talking about human sexuality at the Lambeth Conference. No vote was taken on that point. No formal engaging discussion was taken on that point. And so Justin Welby, working from a position of absence, comes to a uh, conclusion, well, since we didn't talk about it, it must not be important. So Lambeth is going to be about mosquito nets and Korean reunification and the cl- the, political the climate, controversy. The, the climate emergency. Climate change. Yeah. Uh-huh. And now, in one respect, Justin Welby is either, the cl- he's either very clever by allowing a group of people who have no history together. There's no, his, no uh, corporate memory in the primates meeting right now because they haven't met for a while and so many new people. The most senior primate is Albert Chama of Central Africa. Mm-hmm. And he's only been there maybe 10 years. I, I mean, I've been going to primates meeting longer than he has. And the point is that they don't remember what they discussed in the past. They don't look at the meeting minutes of their last meeting. They don't look and there's no memory of what was being done and how things were being done. And this allows Justin Welby to sort of fill out the time of this important meeting when the communion is on the verge of complete and utter crack up to fill the air with second issues. Mm -hmm. 
Rwanda, Uganda, Nigeria, which comprises more than half, I believe, of the active members of the church, didn't come. Um, and what does that tell you? Things are bad. Yet no attempt was made to uh, basically address the issues that prevent Rwanda, Uganda, and uh, Kent, uh, Nigeria from coming. Yep. Yeah. So we'll have to see how this really folds out. But I'm glad they're getting together. I'm glad they're having fellowship. Um, but the the biggest topic in the 21st century here is sexuality, is gender, is transgenderism, is this zeitgeist, this this horrible spirit of the age that is taking over the world. And it's, if, the chur if the church isn't going to talk about it, you will continue to lose. Mm -hmm. Stop it. No, yeah. And human anthropology is the issue. What, mm -hmm. you know, who made me? Why am I this way? What does God's plan for humanity have for us? These are live issues mm -hmm. for the church. Look at what we just have from Rowan Williams. Uh, being trans is, to be, is a journey to wholeness in God. Uh, these are major issues. Now, the Church of England's leadership is remarkable in their refusal to address these things, in their refusal to be a lead on moral issues for English society. And Justin Welby is taking that uh, absentee leadership position on the important issues and applying it to the wider Anglican world. See, in the past, when, you know, when Munir Nice was at the last meeting, a Munir uh, Anise basically said, look, we need to rethink this whole Archbishop of Canterbury business. England can still elect an Archbishop of Canterbury to be leader of the Church of England, but that should not be automatically the le leader of the Anglican world. He should be or she should be elected from within the primates meeting. Um, that was a major issue of importance but Justin Welby waits long enough for time to pass, knowing time is on his side. And when new guy, when the new boys show up, they don't take pick up the discussion where it left off. They pick it up talking about mosquito nets. Now, hear me. Uh, malaria is a major issue. It's an important thing to address. Mm -hmm. But it is not the proper topic for these people because they, do, they are not public health experts. They're not climatologists. They're not uh, biologists. Politicians. I mean, all the things are not. And the, the, the sad thing about the Church of England and the, the larger part of the Anglican Communion is the thing that they're supposed to specialize in, the gospel, they're horrible at it. Yeah. So they don't know anything. They don't know climate change. They don't know politics. They don't know uh, anything, including the gospel. And that's why this church is failing so bad. And, you know, I, I'm looking forward to uh, the upcoming GAFCON in Rwanda and other, other hopes in the Anglican future. But we'll have to see what happens. The, Justin Welby, as I said, is very clever or he's very lucky. Mm -hmm. The times are in his favor. Um, I got I, uh, an item came in from the World Food Program, which is the UN agency dealing with uh, uh, food programs. Food prices uh, are rising across North Africa, and they've now surpassed the point that prompted the Arab Spring a few years ago. Uh, there are food riots uh, in uh, Salon. There are political unrest. And these major issues, uh, unless the church deliberately seeks to address the things that divide us and prevent us from knowing the fullness of Christ in our lives of salvation, the civil unrest, the, rest, the economic turmoil will hijack the conference's agenda. Now, that may be good for short-term political gain and PR purposes, but whatever comes out of a Lambeth conference will do nothing to improve a country's balance of payments. It will do nothing. There's a the foreign uh, the deputy minister Medvedev, Medved, Medvedev, Medvedev announced announced that Russia was now going to use food as a war as a weapon against its enemies. Now Russia provides most of the much of the grain for Western Europe, much of the food stocks. Russia has now said we're going to ship that stuff to Africa, and we're going to ship it to Asia, 
and we're going to accept payment in local currencies. You don't need dollars now to buy Russian food. So Russia is going to be able to pick up the slack in Kenya, Uganda, Nigeria, Burundi, where they're facing severe food shortages and get paid in currency they know is worthless, uh, in Mozambique, for instance, because they know that this is a weapon, that because they're making a billion dollars a day from selling oil to the West. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, is part of the which, war. But it's also a double whammy because most of Africa is completely impoverished uh, because they owe so much money to China. Uh, mm -hmm. China has been bankrupt nations in Africa now for uh, 12, 13, 14 years. And so they don't have the money just to pay for the food. So they're going to have to take IOUs. And so they're going to be indebted to China and indebted to Russia, uh, both unhelpful for the future of Africa. So. Well, one of the things China has done, China has uh, the Solomon Islands in the Central Pacific in its financial grasp. And basically they've said to the prime minister, give us uh, a port for us to station naval vessels and we'll basically go easy on the debts that you owe us. Mm -hmm. So New Zealand and Australia and the United States and the Philippines and Indonesia are now going, oh my God, the Chinese are going to build a naval base in our rear uh, to, in other words, these are the, how should I say, these are major issues of, of major importance, but at the same time, this is not the church, if, if the church doesn't speak on moral issues, instead seeks to sort of join the political debate, then its voice is lost in all the cock, in the cacophony of uh, opinions and talking heads. In this day, in this age, the gospel teaching of love your neighbor and love your enemy are so important. And, and the, the church has no voice anymore. And, and what I think is uh, important is like all those church condemnations of Russia and the war in the Ukraine, they, they fundamentally do not understand what is going on. And they try to paint Vladimir Putin as another Hitler. When what Vladimir Putin is, is another Richelieu or Bismarck. In other Napoleon. words, from, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm, Putin is not interested in conquest. Putin is, Putin is interested in destroying and depopulating those areas that are of concern. There's a fellow named Alexander Dugin, who is a, a very prominent Russian political scientist, and he has Putin's ear. And he's... Uh, He's banned from Twitter and YouTube and Facebook because he's a Ruski. But you can see him on Telegram and on the Internet. And you really need to read these people to understand what's going through Putin's head. Let me, I pulled something up. Uh, here's his advice to Putin. It's advisable to consider moving on to the destruction of industrial facilities and the territories of Ukraine that lay outside our interests especially paying attention to those objects that Ukraine, for obvious reasons, will not be able to restore. Later, such a convenient opportunity to complete the deindustrialization of the Ukraine may not present itself. Russia wants to do what Richelieu did to Germany in the 17th century, in the Thirty Years' War. Depopulate and destroy somebody on your borders. This is what Putin and Yeltsin did in Chechnya. In the 1990s, uh, half of the 1.3 million uh, residents of Chechnya fled. Grozny, the city, was totally destroyed. 100,000 civilians were killed. The Chechen problem is over. Putin is going to keep those territories that he sees as historically Russian, grind Kiev into the dust, destroy the industrial economy, and let the Western U uh, Ukraine be factory farms, so, and Ukraine doesn't present a problem to itself. Ukraine, before the war, half of its working age population had emigrated. Its 30 million population had dropped to 22 million. Since the war started, five million more Ukrainians have left the Ukraine. Putin doesn't want them to come back. He wants to depopulate it and fill up the vacant land with Russians and have the rest being a buffer zone so that Russia will not be threatened. And here's the church's opportunity to speak about 
the depopulation, the destruction, the devastation, but instead we're still on the level of Putin is a Hitler. Putin is not a Hitler. He is not a mad man who wants to conquer. He wants to destroy and depopulate his enemies, just as the Germans did under Bismarck, as the French did under Richelieu, and so on and so forth. It's a, it's a common uh, war strategy uh, to uh, not just conquer, but to make sure you you don't come back. Uh, and, it's and called now the spoils it's not, of war. <laughs> it's so. not wrong for the church to want to speak out on these issues, but they sh but its leaders speaking should be able to speak in a an informed and understanding mode, rather than just parrot what's on the CNN or in the Guardian. Sure. I mean, you got to remember the American military and intelligence elite. These are the guys that lost in Vietnam. These are the guys that lost in Afghanistan. They've got 30 years, 40 years of, of a track record of getting it wrong every single time. Um, listen to Henry Kissinger on this point. This is not George's original thinking. I think Henry Kissinger's a bright guy. Uh, he had but, his good moments, absolutely. All right, so uh, two more topics to, to hit out here. Uh, one is, you're not going to believe this, there's a a clergyman named Marx who lives in Germany. And he's actually a cardinal. And if you uh, watch a reporter's interview with him, you think that the Roman Catholic Church is on the road to gay blessings. And I need to be really clear for my Roman Catholic uh, viewers out there, the Roman Catholic Church already unofficially has been uh, blessing uh, gay uh, couples for for decades uh, you go to liberal uh, Roman Catholic churches in Germany in America and around the world even Ireland uh, you can have your your gay relationship blessed in an unofficial non-liturgical forms not a big deal having Cardinal Marx interpreted to say yeah that's kind of the future here in the Roman Catholic Church we're gonna have gay blessings is a bit shocking George and I'm glad you looked into this for us how soon is this going to occur? Well, on Friday, I saw, I'm sorry, on Saturday, I saw an article on the Catholic News Agency about an interview Cardinal Marx gave with the German magazine Stern, and it was translated into English. And the interviewer asked, Cardinal Marx is the head of the German Episcopal Conference, he's the head of the Catholic Church in Germany, uh, will the church, uh, part of a larger conversation on human sexuality, will the church be uh, revising, changing his teachings on gay blessings, gay marriage. And Marx said uh, in English, yes, yes, and then described that this is a process that we have to look at both sides of the issue. The church is always rethinking itself. And so the Catholic conservative magazines on Saturday went bananas. Marx says, yes, we're going to look at changing gay marriage. Now, if you read it in German, what Marx said was, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, That's no, no. yes, no, no. but it is not used like a yes in an English conversation. It's like, yes, I hear what you're saying. Yes, I hear what I'm you're saying. Yes, 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 but, yes, but. So what Marx was saying was that, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, well, it's something we got to work on and talk about. So, no, Marx did not say this, but there was a brief uh, two-day fury until uh, till the German uh, church said, hey, wait a second, he didn't say this. What are you talking about? But here's the thing. The Catholic conservative press wasn't foolish in their translation error because the German Catholic Church has gone on down all these roads before. And in their recent synod meeting, the synod asked the Catholic Church to bless gay marriages, right. to have women clergy, to do all the stuff that uh, the progressive wing of the Catholic Church wants to do. And so it wasn't a case of this was out of the blue, but rather this was in line with where the synod on the ground is going. And they thought, oh my goodness, Cardinal Marx has finally rolled over and said, okay, we'll do it. Not quite. Not quite. All right. Final story. I'm uh, going to bring this up here for our viewers to see. Um, you posted this little uh, op ed on uh, Anglica.inc. Orthodoxy is finished. And uh, 
definitely a, a big story because people, why would Kevin and George post something like this on Anglican.inc? And I think we're, uh, I'll let George answer that, but uh, I want to draw attention to, first of all, uh, uh, His Holiness Corral and his statements and re recent preachings um, because he's he's taken the line of Putin. He's taken the line of uh, Russia and he is okay with what is happening because he sees this as a fight against the West. And for some of us, we're like, what happened to orthodoxy? Why isn't there accountability within orthodoxy? Why aren't people saying to uh, Corel, no, the church doesn't stand for war and certainly these types of atrocities. So George, first let's answer the question, why is that story on Anglican.inc? The, the <sighs> finest publication in the Anglican communion next to Anglican Unscripted. Why? Well, I think it's important because we don't operate as Anglicans in isolation. That's right. And the uh, issues that have divided the Anglican world are not the same that are dividing the Orthodox world, but the temperature within Orthodoxy is reaching Anglican levels. You know, I think it's uh, been hotter than Anglican for a while. Uh, Nick uh, Krakakis is a professor at the Australian Catholic University. He's Greek Orthodox. And he wrote an op-ed piece, which we republished in part and linked to all of it. And it is really strong. And this is from a serious theologian and thinker. Here's one line. Kirill is no doubt deranged, but he's now also dangerous. Dangerous because he's backing his even more deranged dictator who may soon be using chemical weapons. Uh, what's the gist of this article? Well, what, what uh, the author is saying is that this we've reached a point where one leader of an Orthodox church is urging his people to make war on the leader of another Orthodox church. And that the mission of whole of the Orthodox Church is an orthodoxy, but Russianness is what the basic charge is. And if Russianness is the mission of the Orthodox Church, then we're going to have the Orthodox problem of nationalism. You know, in the United States we have the Greeks and the Ruth and Right. All the Eastern European countries have their own Orthodox dioceses and overlapping jurisdictions, and it's one of their ongoing problems. And they've been trying to overcome this to form a single unitary canonical Orthodox Church of the USA, uh, but it's not happened. When Kirill goes down the line of saying being Russian is being Orthodox and the word of God uh, that Vladimir Putin is an agent of the Lord seeking to defend Holy Mother Russia and the Third Jerusalem from the evil sectarian West, the United States. Uh, I'll take the story even further. Uh, I pulled up, uh, here it is, pulled up Kirill's sermon on Sunday. Uh, on Sunday, Kirill preached at the Cathedral for the Russian military in Moscow. And in Russian, the sermon was printed on the website of the uh, Moscow Patriarchate. And I have enough Russian plus Google's help to get through it. <laughs> and Kirill said some stuff which, if you're an opponent like Krakakis, you can basically go bananas about. Um, it, what's a little line? First off, he's uh, saying, here's a paragraph. Today, the word independence is often applied to almost all countries of the world, but that is wrong, because most of the countries of the world are now under the colossal influence of one force, which today unfortunately opposes the force of our people. The enemy is the United States, or Western, secular, NATO, EU, yeah. NATO, the United States. And they are, so the Ukrainians really are, and, and here's another thing that he goes in. In the Middle Ages, wishing to re weaken Russia, various forces pushed the brothers against each other, Ukrainians, Belarusians, Russian, plunging them into internecine strife. So it is happening today. Therefore, we must do everything we can to stop the bloodshed 
and to avoid the danger of internecine strife with all its consequences, but at the same time we must be faithful. When I say we, I mean first of all the military to our oath and readiness to lay down our lives for our friends as the word of God testifies. We are saving the Ukrainians from themselves. We are bombing, this is the, the, old, hack, the old expression for the Vietnam War, we had to bomb the village, we had to destroy the village to save the village. Yeah. We have to destroy the Ukraine as an independent nation to save the Ukrainian people from the evil influences of the West. This is strong stuff from Kirill, and people like uh, the Greek Orthodox uh, professor from Australia are saying, if this is going to be the way the biggest Orthodox Church acts, then Orthodoxy is done as a coherent body of churches. If, if this had been a Episcopal bishop in the 1970s saying that uh, uh, Jesus was never resurrected, 70 to 75 percent of Episcopal bishops would have responded with some type of press release or statement or joint statement. I don't see any bishops or holinesses or metropolitans responding to Corral publicly. In Russia, the, the, they just had a meeting of the Synod, the Holy Synod of the Russian Orthodox Church, and uh, three Ukrainian metropolitans, including the head of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church under Russia in the Ukraine, skipped the meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't issue a statement denouncing it, uh, Kirill, but they just did what the Nigerians, Ugandans, and the Rwandans did, and not show up after they were invited to the party and have made known their displeasure with Kirill. Now the Orthodox world is divided. Some Orthodox churches like the Bulgarians and the church in Jerusalem are backing the Russians. Others like the church in Alexandria and Georgia are, and Greece are backing uh, the uh, Ukrainians in the Ecumenical Patriarchate. So why is this an Anglican story? because though the issues are different, no, they're not really that different. No, they're not different at all. Because yeah. you know, the, the, the slam against the Episcopal Church and the Church of England is that they have replaced the Christian message with American or English culture. This is what we talked about with the transgenderism issue. The slam against the Russian Orthodox Church by the other Orthodox is they've replaced Christian culture with Russianness. And so if you really get down to it, it's the same general issue of losing sight of the gospel and losing sight of Christ's eternal and unchanging world and replacing it with uh, issues of time and place that are not truly pertinent to well, the work of the church. We have replaced the good news with the zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. Okay, the spirit of the age is the good news now. Uh, in the Western church, and it now in the Russian church. It is the same issue. Uh, you, you've you've uh, added or subtracted from Jesus. Heresy, in, in, in my mind's eye. Kevin, the Orthodox are never heretics. No, I didn't say Orthodox, I said Corel. Okay, well, I think we covered all the topics. I got myself in trouble again. That's life. Um, no, we're not doing Indian corruption. And you guys have been so patient. You don't know this, but in the background, I've had an RV tech putting new cameras on the outside of the rig. He's come in and out a couple times. And so if you see edits or you saw edits in the show, that was me responding to the RV tech or some alarm went off in the front. We're all set. The show is done. George is back on schedule. His life is back together. He has time now for naps. And you're available Friday, right? Yes, I am. I don't know because I have I have my eye surgery on Thursday. I should be good. We'll see. Well, I may show up on the Friday show with an eye patch or two because I'm going to take the pressure washer home from church <laughs> and start on the patio <laughs> and uh, see what I blast into my face when I turn on the 3500 psi stream of water. And we are uh, 25 days from breaking camp here uh, at the Florida Grand in Webster, Florida, and starting our travels again. But Kevin, the gas price is five fifty. I know. I know. 
And, and we'll be covering that as part of our travels. So we're going to Key West first, and then we're headed north uh, in the middle of May. So uh, keep watching just for those adventures, and thank you for watching Anglican Unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 726 of Anglican Unscripted.